So tonight we're um, looking at, um, at another diptych. I've used the image of uh, diptychs. I'll say just a little bit more about that because I, I do think they are kind of organized in that way of balanced scenes. Uh, and tonight we're going to be looking at uh, two. Um, one, the story of Nicodemus and uh, his conversation with uh, Jesus by night in Jerusalem, which is followed by what I say are two diptychs. Um, one uh, about uh, John baptizing and Jesus baptizing, as a matter of fact, uh, and John saying uh, a final word about his relationship to Jesus using another image of friend of the groom. And then uh, chapter three concludes with a, um, a bit of reflection, apparently from a different voice, the voice of the narrator, uh, stepping back a little bit from the action and from the dialogue, but using some of the same themes that Jesus himself has used in his dialogue with Nicodemus. Uh, and again, a lot of dichotomies going on there, too. Uh, the second um, part of the big diptych uh, for today is the um, uh, encounter with an anonymous woman named in the Orthodox tradition Fotina, uh, an anonymous woman by day in Samaria. And that, too, is followed by uh, a pair of, of scenes, uh, one where Jesus is in dialogue with his disciples and one where the Samaritans uh, arrive and come to some, some level of belief uh, in Jesus on the basis of the testimony of um, the woman. And then um, this whole section concludes with a passage we won't uh, really have time to, to look at today, uh, that is the healing in Galilee, which is labeled the second sign, the first one having been the um, uh, wine miracle at Cana which also serves as a kind of uh, diptych, if you will, framing all of this uh, section of the gospel. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at uh, today. And just a word about these dualities. I've used the artistic term diptych, but you can think about um, other terms too that might be appropriate. And um, this is uh, striking, I think, in, in light of uh, our aversion to binaries. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation in uh, recent years about how simple dichotomies uh, um, oversimplify life in many ways, uh, especially in uh, connection with conversations about gender. Uh, the, uh, the life of gendered human beings is a, a little more complicated than a simple male-female binary seems to suggest. I think we've come to appreciate that in recent years. Um, but I think we have to recognize that the ancients delighted in uh, binary oppositions. Antithesis was a uh, common rhetorical trope and um, everybody in the world in this period had some acquaintance with rhetoric, uh, either through their own training or th through uh, constant exposure to it in the public sphere. And then uh, philosophers going way back to Heraclitus, the famous pre-Socratic philosopher in the end of the uh, sixth, beginning of the fifth century BC, made a big deal of um, antithesis or binary oppositions. And he, in fact, made a kind of metaphysical principle out of it, saying that everything is a unity of uh, opposites. And he constructed paradoxical discourse on the basis of, of that uh, claim. And something like that may lurk uh, distantly in the background. A little closer is um, our friend Philo of Alexandria, whom we've encountered before in talking about um, uh, the Logos, the word of God that pervades things and his divine presence in uh, the created order. Um, in one of his treatises um, uh, called Who is the Heir of Divine Things, uh, Philo goes on at great length uh, about the Logos, a divine word, uh, which he compares to a two-edged sword. And this is a bit of a trope that we find in various places. We're familiar uh, with it from the New Testament, where um, word is associated with tongue and the shape of the tongue is compared with that of uh, a sword. You find that in uh, Hebrews chapter four and in uh, the book of Revelation, where the uh, figure of the son of man or the rider on the white horse both has a sword coming forth from his mouth. And with that, sword, uh, two-edged sword, uh, he slays his enemies. Well, it's a way of saying that um, uh, the Messiah uh, achieves his ends by his word uh, rather than by military means. But in any case, the imagery is out there. Philo uses it to say, you know, this is in fact how we construe all of our speech and speech is made up of a um, whole variety of, of uh, binary oppositions. Um, diptychs, if you will. 
And so there's an association of the Logos with binary oppositions. And it's not surprising then that it should uh, emerge in the fourth gospel coming out of something like uh, the background that Philo represents. Um, and, yeah, just a bit of, if you will, esoteric background. Now let's turn to the, the narrative of John three with John and uh, Jesus and Nicodemus. Uh, the setting is in Jerusalem at Passover, one of the explicit references um, to Passover, and we've talked about the fact that there are three of them mentioned in the, the fourth gospel. Uh, Nicodemus is described as a leader of the Jews, a leading Pharisee, and he comes to Jesus um, by night. Mm, why by night? Maybe he doesn't want uh, anybody else to know that he's having this encounter with Jesus. Uh, he says he's attracted by the signs that Jesus has done. And we've talked uh, a little bit uh, in the past about the role of signs and how there seems to be a uh, recognition that uh, in the Jesus tradition and in uh, the general tradition out of which early Christianity comes, miraculous deeds could be called signs. But John has another uh, layer of meaning that he wants to add to them. In any case, it's not insignificant that Nicodemus is attracted by the signs or the miracles that Jesus does but he doesn't quite seem to get the uh, discourse that Jesus is engaged in. And that I think reflects um, uh, the move that the gospel as a whole is making, um, pushing characters within the text and readers of the text too, to try to probe deeper and understand more fully um, what it is that uh, Jesus is offering. Nicodemus in any case uh, appears here in chapter three, and he appears in two other um, cases in the gospel. Uh, one in uh, chapter seven, where he's engaged in, in dialogue with members of the, uh, the leadership in Jerusalem. And uh, he makes a legal point uh, saying that they shouldn't uh, uh, act um, uh, precipitously against Jesus. And people wonder, my goodness, are you becoming a Galilean? Uh, are you becoming a follower of Jesus? Well, is he or isn't he? He appears again in chapter 19 uh, at the burial of Jesus where he comes with an enormous amount of um, myrrh and aloes, uh, fragrant stuff to anoint the body of Jesus before it's uh, put in the tomb. Uh, is that a um, uh, kind of uh, symbolic statement of his belief in Jesus? Or is it a focus on the fact that Jesus has died uh, rather than um, a realization that that's not the end of the story? Uh, whatever, um, there's a little ambiguity. Uh, about Nicodemus, which raises uh, an interesting issue in reading the gospel that um, critics these days have spent a lot of time uh, worrying about, and that is um, the, the way in which characters are portrayed and developed in the gospel. Um, it used to be the case that um, uh, the gospel was seen as focusing uh, primarily, if not exclusively, on the character of Jesus, and all the others were kind of flat figures making a particular point um, and not showing any development. Well, we know that um, uh, this text is not going to develop characters the way a modern novel would, but is it simply the case that they're being used as ciphers or is there some uh, way of, uh, of showing a, a fuller picture of a human being engaging with Jesus? And many people have pointed to Nicodemus and the way in which uh, he emerges in these later chapters as a pointer in that direction, that we, we ought to pay attention to the way in which characters are portrayed and the way in which their uh, interactions with Jesus uh, develop uh, over time. There may be a message being conveyed there. In any case, it's worth thinking about. Um, in any case, Nicodemus comes on the scene and engages in a dialogue with Jesus. And uh, the, the dialogue focuses on a, a Greek word that can have two meanings. The word is anothen, which can mean again or from above. And um, Nicodemus construes it in a simple physical way. Um, uh, how can I get into my mother's womb again, he asks, uh, thinking of being born again um, in a simple physical fashion. Um, but no, Jesus is using the term in another way, being born from above. And the audience probably gets the point. Um, I don't think many people would be surprised. Um, and, and they can, in some ways, we uh, can, in some ways, uh, laugh at um, Nicodemus a little bit. Boy, are you stupid? 
Uh, why didn't you get that little point that there's a deeper meaning to this word than you seem to be giving it? Um, that phenomenon of uh, reacting to a character in a dramatic scene like this is a prime example of dramatic irony. And we know that ancient um, dramatists used that and uh, used it to great effect. Uh, probably the uh, most interesting and best known example of it would be um, the uh, Bacchae of Euripides, the story about Dionysus coming to town and uh, being resisted by uh, the local king, Pentheus. Um, Dionysus becomes, uh, if you will, incarnate, uh, visible to Pentheus and engages him as if he were a human being. And we all understand, we, the audience, understand what's going on. Pentheus, of course, doesn't get it at all. And at the end of the day, he's torn apart because of his resistance to uh, Dionysus. Well, um, that's a, um, a clear case of dramatic irony and something like that is going on here. But anytime we see dramatic irony and we uh, laugh at a character in a play or a story, um, we ought to pause and think, um, is there a kind of another level of uh, irony going on? Is it clear that we get what's uh, being said in the story? Or are we too, in some ways, like Nicodemus? I think, I think we need to be aware of that in, in John, that there's often uh, another uh, complex layer of uh, irony that's uh, uh, coming along. Um, in any case, um, it, Jesus seems to be pointing to a different kind of birth than getting back into your mother's womb, uh, a birth that involves water and spirit. Uh, and this is where the uh, higher level of irony kicks in. So what is he talking about? Is he talking about baptism? Uh, the reference to a water would seem to point in that direction. And there seems to be throughout the gospel allusions to uh, Christian ritual activity. We'll see that again in a major way when we look at uh, chapter six next week. And I suspect that there's probably an allusion uh, going on here. Uh, to the Christian ritual of, of baptism. And we'll see some confirmation of that, I think, when we look at the, um, the subsidiary diptychs. Um, but there's something uh, else being said about baptism, um, that the water in itself is not um, sufficient. It's uh, water and spirit. And with spirit, uh, there comes something of uh, the notion of belief. And belief and understanding of who Jesus is is essential to rebirth, I think, is what John is saying. Uh, John doesn't deny the validity or importance of baptism, but says there's a dimension to it that you have to get. And he'll do the same thing uh, when uh, we engage in um, consideration of the Eucharist a little later on. Uh, interesting as always to see how uh, the scene is imagined by various artists. Um, and we could spend a lot of time on uh, this, but I'll only show two little pictures. One by an African-American artist of the uh, late 19th and early 20th century, Henry uh, Osawa Tanner, spent most of his time in Paris um, and uh, before the First World War, established quite a reputation as a painter, um, was in decline after that. But in any case, here we have Jesus looking very mysterious and Nicodemus um, uh, looking at him kind of in awe um, and that's capturing some of the flavor, I think, of their interaction as John portrays it. Uh, here's another earlier version, and this is by uh, Krein Hendricks uh, Falmarin, a Dutch um, painter of the 17th century, the golden age of Dutch art, painting with the conventions um, put in place uh, uh, by Italian artists, especially Caravaggio at the beginning of the 17th century. So the strong contrast of light and dark uh, and the dramatic um, interaction of characters, uh, very Caravaggio-esque. Uh, in any case, uh, this uh, little uh, picture is interesting because it has um, Jesus pointing to a text um, and uh, Nicodemus uh, sort of getting the message maybe from the text. Mm -hmm. uh, that's adding a dimension to the story. Uh, they're not talking about a text here. Uh, they're talking about something else, uh, about an encounter with Jesus. And that I think is probably worth, um, uh, worth keeping in mind. But interesting to think, how would you portray the two of them if they were interacting with one another? Okay, so um, thinking about uh, parallels to this story, uh, 
Um, it, like the uh, marriage at Cana, there's not much in the way of synoptic parallels that uh, strike us. There are some encounters between Jesus and people that uh, might have some distant relationship to what's going on here. There's the rich young man who asks Jesus what he needs to, to do to be saved, and uh, Jesus um, gets around to telling him pretty quickly uh, what it is. Uh, it's a public exchange. Jesus is pretty straightforward. Um, so it's not exactly the same uh, in terms of the dramatic uh, dynamics that are going on, similar in terms of maybe the social standing of the characters. And then there's the mysterious uh, case of the youth who was with Jesus at night in the Garden of Gethsemane who runs away leaving his clothes behind. What was going on there? Um, people have asked, but there's no exchange, no account of uh, what their encounter was like. Uh, what we have here is an encounter by night, all right, uh, and a pretty um, significant dialogue. Um, uh, another interesting parallel comes from outside of the Christian tradition, and I suspect that John is drawing on some literary archetypes here that are uh, uh, perhaps unfamiliar to us. Uh, there's something called the Corpus Hermeticum, which is a collection of uh, works from the oh, probably first to the third century uh, CE, set in ancient Egypt. Um, with diverse uh, components, uh, a lot of uh, Greek philosophy and eclectic popular piety, uh, and some texts like uh, probably the most famous uh, element of the corpus, the uh, text called the Poimandres, Corpus Hermeticum I, which has a story of creation, uh, which has some echoes of Genesis in it. And uh, it's entirely likely that the Corpus Hermeticum and people who put it together also were in some kind of dialogue uh, with or uh, knew about some Jewish traditions. Um, most of the texts consist of dialogue between uh, a divine figure, Hermes Trismegistos, and his pupil Toph. And one text in particular, Corpus Hermeticum 13, is a discussion of rebirth and the dynamics between the divine, uh, thrice blessed, uh, or tri thrice greatest Hermes and his uh, pupil look an awful lot like the dynamics between Jesus and um, Nicodemus in this story. So it's possible that uh, this is the kind of uh, inspiration for the encounter that we have here, uh, a kind of popular philosophical um, dialogue. Some people have worried about whether there's some history behind this text. Uh, because the name Nicodemus is, uh, is one that appears in uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian, uh, writing toward the end of the first century, um, in a couple of places in his antiquities, where he talks about a prominent Jerusalemite who was uh, an ambassador or playing some political role. Um, this is in Antiquities 14. And he also talks about uh, someone who is uh, named Nicodemus or Nicomedes, uh, there are textual variants here. Um, who is the father of a leader of the revolt against Rome. Uh, so this uh, fellow would have been around in the middle of the, um, uh, the first century CE, not too distant from uh, the time when Jesus was around. So it's possible that um, uh, there's a gesture toward a known figure in uh, the Jerusalem hierarchy, uh, whether or not Jesus actually met him. And the rabbis also mention a figure named uh, Nakdimon ben Gurion, a wealthy Jerusalemite prior to the uh, destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And so there are different traditions that point in the direction of someone with this name. So it's um, entirely possible that uh, our author uses a character from history uh, in creating this literary scene, whether or not there was any historical encounter between Jesus and a fellow named Nic Nicodemus. So after the initial dialogue and after um, uh, Jesus has uh, made it clear that one has to be born from above, uh, whether or not Nicodemus gets that. Uh, there are further questions on the table, and the first is actually posed by Nicodemus in um, chapter 3, verse 9. And he basically asks, how in the world is um, uh, birth anothan from above, if that's what you're talking about, oh Jesus, how does that happen? And Jesus responds, he chides Nicodemus and say, what, you're a wise guy, you don't get this. Uh, and he, his answer focuses on the son of man who has come down from heaven. So birth from above is possible because the one who makes it possible is himself from above, is in effect the answer uh, 
uh, to Nicodemus's question, how does this happen? Um, but then there are further implicit questions. Um, Nicodemus doesn't actually go and pose this question, but the answer is given in the next couple of verses, in verses uh, uh, 14 through 16. How does this son of man coming from above deliver whatever it is he brings? And there we get the second big son of man saying, we talked about the son of man sayings last time, uh, and talking about uh, 151 here and uh, 314, uh, the son of man is lifted up. And as we saw in um, uh, 151, an another Old Testament text is um, brought to bear on what it means to have the son of man uh, playing a role. And this one is uh, Numbers 21.8, uh, where Moses lifts up the serpent. Uh, and who, by being seen, causes people to be healed. Um, and that uh, is given further interpretation because it's belief in the Son of Man that causes the healing and the borning, being born from above that Jesus is talking about, which leads to the famous um, uh, football theological statement, God so loved the world, etc. Why do I say that? Because it's on uh, uh, the, the billboards all the time in uh, many football games. Okay, um, so the dialogue continues with an implicit question and an answer to that question. But that, of course, leads to more questions. Uh, a question that isn't made explicit, but I think if we keep the question in mind, we understand um, the next turn in the dialogue in verses uh, 17 and following. Um, because the Son of Man has been introduced uh, to answer the question of how something from above happens. Well. The person who's delivering it comes from above and you have to believe him. Um, but the next question reflects, uh, I think, some of the stuff we were talking about last time. Doesn't the Son of Man mean someone who is going to come as a judge? And what does it mean to have this Son of Man being involved in rebirth? So Jesus, in effect, answers that question. Um, and usually Jesus' answers to questions take a, a slightly different turn. He seems to m move away from the dialogue. But if you think of the underlying questions that are on the table, you can see what they, the rationale for moving in this direction might be. And I think that's the rationale, that the Son of Man is associated with judgment. Where? In Christian circles, as well as in Jewish circles, but particularly in Christian circles. And we saw them last time, um, Mark 13, Mark 14. Um, and Jesus' answer here is um, that light, when it comes, is either accepted or rejected, and people judge themselves by their acceptance or their rejection. He who does the truth comes to the light. It's up to people to make the determination whether they accept this possibility of being born from above. Um, this bears on the question, which we'll have to uh, explore a little more in detail uh, in a subsequent section, uh, about um, uh, predeterminism or, or um, uh, divine calling in John and what that means. Uh, is there um, a kind of Calvinist theory going on in John or is there something else? I don't think so. But the language is there and we'll have to explore how it works. Here, in any case, it's clear. No, people are responsible for their response to what the light presents to them. And the Son of Man, therefore, is not himself a judge. He affects judgment, but doesn't judge. Uh, a nice little distinction that John wants to make. Um, useful to step back for a minute and think about this um, language of rebirth that we have here, in addition to the um, material from the Corpus Hermeticum. It's also there in early Christian uh, sources. Paul talks about begetting his converts in 1 Corinthians, um, or um, talking about Onesimus and Philemon, he can talk about uh, uh, his, his role in their being reborn. So John isn't inventing this language. And sure enough, um, my friend Philo also uses it, talking about developments in the life of Moses, particularly his becoming a prophet, uh, which was uh, for him, says Philo, a second birth, better than the first. Why? because he was being born from above and getting the spirit of God in a new way. So uh, the kind of language that we have here and the play on, uh, uh, on various kinds of dichotomies uh, is not unique to John. He's picking it up and developing it from um, Jewish and early Christian sources. 
Um, so much then for the encounter with Nicodemus, the um, this, uh, final diptych in uh, chapter three consists of um, a reference to uh, Jesus baptizing and everyone coming to him. Well, this picks up on the implicit baptismal theme that we uh, suggested is there with the water and the spirit language uh, in the dialogue with Nicodemus. Um, note, however, that in chapter four, we have a correction of this. And the narrator there says, Jesus didn't personally baptize, it was just his disciples. Why? Probably because there's a, no tradition of Jesus engaging in baptism. Whatever the historical reality was, Jesus isn't portrayed as going around and baptizing. But John has to have him baptize here because baptism is one of the things that is being alluded to in um, the Nicodemus discourse. And he has to correct it. Some people say, oh, this is um, uh, an editor correcting an earlier mistake. Nah, it'd be easier just to erase the earlier mistake. So I think you have John uh, adding nuance here to the way in which he's developing a theme, uh, not unusual. In any case, Jesus baptizes, the report is given to John the Baptist, everybody's coming to Jesus, what's up? And uh, John reaffirms um, uh, what he had said before, that it's okay because he's not the main character in this whole divine drama. Uh, God is in charge, God's taking uh, care of things. And I'm just the friend of the groom. Um, this may be a Johannine adaptation of a saying uh, that Jesus uh, is attrib attributed to Jesus in places like uh, Mark 2, 19, that best men, groomsmen don't fast when the uh, bridegroom is around. Uh, well, the notion that Jesus is the bridegroom is here, but it's used in a new way uh, to think about um, the, um, the Baptist is just the friend of the groom, putting him in his place. And the Baptist says, uh, uh, it's his time. Well, it is and it isn't, isn't it? Because we've already heard in Cana, um, the, the, uh, at the Cana miracle, my time has not yet come. But as a matter of fact, it was coming because he started his signs at that point. So I think we have a similar kind of play going on here. Yes, it's the time of Jesus, but the time is just beginning. Okay. Then the final um, uh, half of this last diptych, uh, words of reflection by, not the Baptist, I don't think, by the narrator, stepping back from the action uh, and making connections that Jesus is uh, the one from above, all right, and he's in charge of things. He's uh, the greatest, the true witness. Um, and this is a theme that's going to come up time and again until Jesus himself declares himself to be the witness before Pilate. Um, and uh, then a reflection on the, um, uh, uh, the rebirth notion using baptismal language, because the language of sealing is language that was used in baptismal ritual in uh, early Christianity. Um, and uh, the one who accepts the one from above seals the deal, says uh, the narrator here, uh, playing once more on the baptismal stuff. Um, but remember, says the narrator, the one who comes from above is the one who speaks God's words. And it's believing and understanding those words that the, that's the key to rebirth. And you either have to do that or you face divine wrath. Um, that is the effects of judgment, judgment that comes from your own decision, whether to accept or reject. So that is uh, uh, chapter three, um, uh, the interestingly complex story of Jesus and Nicodemus, and then uh, two stages of reflection on it. Uh, let's turn now to um, chapter four for a quick look at uh, Jesus and uh, Photina. I'll use uh, her name in the Orthodox tradition, even though it's not in the text. Um, what we have here, first of all, is the correction that I've already mentioned. Then the setting at Jacob's well, um, a place in Samaria, um, a request for water uh, from Jesus, um, which soon turns into a promise of living water. So water with a different sense, just as birth had two senses uh, back in chapter three. So water has two senses here in chapter four, uh, the physical substance or something else, uh, whatever that living water is. Um, then we have a dialogue between Jesus and the um, gal in which uh, she said, he says to her, why don't you call your hubby? I said, well, I don't have one. 
He said, oh, yeah, of course you don't. You have five. So he knows a lot about this uh, uh, young lady in the way in which he knew about um, uh, characters earlier on in the text in chapter one uh, and the way in which he's uh, said to know human beings in, in chapter, uh, chapter two. Um, this leads into a dialogue uh, about worship and where true worship takes place in Samaria or in Jerusalem reflecting the uh, Jerusalem-Samaritan uh, split. And Jesus says, no, it's going to uh, be neither of these, but it's going to be something else, worship in spirit and in truth. Um, so Jesus, as always, is promising something uh, new and different and better than what was there. But at the same time, and this is important for our understanding of um, uh, the relationship between um, John, Jesus, and the Jews, salvation is from the Jews, says Jesus. And uh, what is the significance of that in the grand scheme of things? Uh, we'll have to come back to that one. Finally, there's a recognition on the part of um, uh, the woman that Jesus might be the Messiah because the Messiah is supposed to tell all. Uh, and Jesus has told her a lot. And Jesus says, yep, um, the, the one that you're expecting, the one who tells all, that's me. Uh, I am. And I am saying that we're going to have to come back to as we think about how Jesus identifies himself in many ways and finally identifies himself just with that term, I am. But here, it doesn't have that deep meaning uh, that's associated with the name of God. It's simply a colloquial expression meaning, yeah, that's me. Uh, like everything else in John, or just about everything else, there's more than one level of meaning uh, to that phrase. And this is one case where uh, the simple uh, dialogical meaning of it's me makes perfectly good sense. What we have here is a classical recognition scene. And uh, many of the encounters between Jesus and his uh, interlocutors in the gospel are recognition scenes where people come to some understanding. A flash of light goes off in their heads uh, as they see something about who Jesus is. And uh, the question constantly posed to the reader is, are you seeing the same thing? Or do you see everything there is to be seen in Jesus? In any case, she goes off and uh, says to the people of Samaria, come and see, uh, using the same language that the first disciples um, had seen, had used back there in chapter one. And she gives expression to her, her incipient belief, if you will, uh, with a kind of hesitating, oh, maybe, perhaps he is the Christ, the Messiah. Does she express robust belief? Well, maybe not, but it's a step in the right direction in the same way that Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night exhibits a step in the right direction. Um, <clears throat> so what do we make of this encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman? Again, we could turn to um, some encounters that um, uh, are there in the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, the Syrophoenician woman or the, in Mark or the Canaanite woman in Matthew. It's the same story with a different label for the woman. Um, well, there's an interesting encounter there to be sure, uh, but Jesus is kind of disdainful of uh, the woman in that case. And uh, the woman pushes back and uh, engages with Jesus in a way that, uh, uh, that uh, wins the day for her. Uh, she gives a witty response to his dismissal of her uh, and earns exorcism for her daughter and prays in the Gospel of Matthew, at least, uh, where Jesus says, great is your faith. So there's um, precedent in the uh, tradition of telling stories of Jesus, of Jesus having an encounter with a woman, although the dynamics of that encounter are rather different in this case. Um, there's also the division between Samaritans and Jews, which I think we need to keep into account, uh, that had been in place for uh, several centuries. Um, and uh, interesting re to reflect on how uh, the New Testament uh, uh, comments on or um, makes uh, allusions to that, um, um, uh, that relationship between Jews and Samaritans. In Matthew, Jesus says, don't go there. Instead of going and uh, uh, in effecting a, a conversion as he does here in John, no, he says, don't go to the Samaritans, just go to the house of Israel. Uh, Luke has a slightly different version, 
uh, not of the uh, going or not going, but uh, and the judgment about them in the parable of the Good Samaritan. So some of them at least can be good uh, when they do what people are supposed to do and take care of those who are in need. Acts finally gives the uh, account that it's the apostles, particularly Philip, who goes and converts um, the uh, Samaritans. And they get converted when they see signs, according to Acts. Uh, Acts 8. Hmm. Just like Nicodemus uh, getting some sort of conversion or call to Jesus because of the signs. But is that enough? And is John reflecting in some ways on stories like the conversion story in Acts 8 um, that's based upon uh, encounter with signs? All that I think is lurking in the background here, and John is playing with those elements. <clears throat> but there's another important uh, tradition that's at work here, a literary tradition coming out of the Old Testament, and that's um, the, the, um, the notion that a well is a place for a pickup. Um, and we find this in, um, in Genesis and in Exodus. Abraham and Jacob and Moses all meet their brides at wells uh, and have an encounter with the women that they're going to be spending time with later on. Um, so there's, uh, by saying uh, Jacob's well, uh, the uh, author of this story conjures up a stereotype uh, that sets the scene and says, hmm, uh, there's something about attraction between male and female that's going to be going on here. Pay attention to it, readers. Here, the uh, engagement goes in a somewhat unexpected way. It seems that the gal is pursuing the guy rather than the guy pursuing the gal, as was the case in the, the Old Testament stories. And the guy here plays a little bit hard to get. Jesus saying, if you only knew, hmm, not exactly uh, coming on strong, right? But it's precisely this, um, this reticence that attracts the gal in this case, uh, who finally is shocked by his insight into her and then she sees who he really is. She has this recognition. Uh, this is at the Fetch Hubby Exchange, when she realizes that Jesus has preternatural knowledge. He's not just any old guy. We could uh, construe this as um, uh, a play on infatuation, which Greeks might call eros, uh, being transformed into agape or loving service because what is uh, the, the next stage of um, her life is that she's going on a mission to Samaria. She leaves her jug behind and goes, tells everybody what's uh, happened. So uh, she has been made into, if you will, a kind of apostle, uh, even though she's not ordained and even though her faith is a little bit hesitant. Um, the artistic tradition here is rich. Um, we have uh, scenes from antiquity at Apollinare uh, Nuovo in Ravenna, a mosaic from the uh, 4th, 5th century, a woman at the well and Jesus, uh, kind of sedate there, and the evangelist looking on at the side, I'm sure. Um, uh, once we get to the, um, uh, the Baroque period, uh, things get a little, um, a little more dramatic, I should expect. Uh, Anabali Karachi uh, in the 16th century has Jesus and the woman interacting in an interesting way uh, with uh, their, uh, uh, their attraction to and uh, resistance to that attraction uh, going on. Um, and we have Bernardo Strozzi, uh, similar kind of thing with a big uh, circle, uh, almost a dance going on between them. Um, Giovanni Barbieri, Il uh, Guercino, um, Jesus, in all of these cases, pointing to something else, the woman looking longingly at him. And I think the, the one that gets the most erotic is this one here, Carlo Morato, uh, going into the uh, 17th, early 18th century, um, uh, with uh, the woman showing not exactly what you'd expect in the first century um, uh, garb. Um, there was a statue outside of the office um, uh, where I sat for uh, many years at Notre Dame, which showed the same scene. Um, uh, the woman, very demure here, as you'd expect uh, at Notre Dame, and Jesus still pointing, pointing somewhere else. And then there were some uh, witty ones like uh, this uh, uh, Chinese uh, painting from the 20th century, uh, where the woman looks uh, a little bit like the Syrophoenician woman, I think, a little saucier than uh, Fotina is in John 4. Uh, 
Um, but in any case, there's a dynamic going on there to be sure. Okay, so we have this interesting scene of um, Jesus and the woman at the well that uh, evokes all sorts of um, connections of various sorts and uh, all sorts of interplay between men and women and a conversion of uh, uh, love to uh, service, which we might expect in the fourth gospel. We have the added diptych at the end uh, where the disciples come along and uh, wonder if Jesus has anything to eat. In some ways, this is um, introducing the theme that's uh, going to dominate uh, chapter six. And so uh, we have a number of connections throughout the gospel pointing ahead uh, to elements that are going to uh, appear in later scenes. And this, I think, is a good suggestion or a good indication that what we have in this text is something that's been thought through and um, is planned in, in a very deliberate way. It's not just thrown together. And uh, along with the gesture to um, food is uh, the interpretation of food. Once again, levels of meaning, um, uh, birth, uh, physical, spiritual, uh, water, physical, spiritual, food, physical, spiritual, yes. And the spiritual meaning here is to do um, the Father's will. Uh, we'll need to keep this in mind as we think about um, the bread of life discourse and the complexity of the um, the work that's going on there and in interpreting a symbol. Um, finally, we have harvest Im imagery, uh, where in effect the disciples are um, uh, are being commissioned, uh, kind of uh, in an off the cuff, off the cuff way, uh, to go and do the harvesting that uh, needs to be done by bringing people in. Uh, harvest imagery, of course, is uh, common in the uh, gospel tradition. We have the uh, parable of the sower. And in fact, there may be a bit of an allusion here uh, to the uh, parable of the sower because Jesus has in fact been sowing the seeds uh, which are later going to be harvested in other traditions, uh, reports of other traditions of uh, conversions of the Samaritans. So uh, there may be a gesture here toward what Acts reports. Uh, finally then, uh, the uh, last part of the small diptych is um, the Samaritans coming and um, echoing um, what the initial disciples uh, said when they were talking to Jesus. Uh, they asked him to stay with them for a while, to abide, using the same word that the disciples asked, where are you staying? Where do you minnow? Um, and Jesus abides with them for two days. So yeah, there's a relationship that goes on here, but it's not the final abiding relationship uh, that Jesus is going to be talking about and promising when he comes to the Last Supper discourses. So we have the more physical meaning of the word here, later the uh, deeper meaning um, that will be explained once we get to those discourses. Um, here, uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, the Samaritans believe in Jesus's word, not in the signs that his disciples have done. So I do think that there's a, a kind of... Um, a critical dialogue going on here between uh, John and the traditions of conversion of the Samaritans um, that we get in Acts, where John is saying, mm, it may be the case that some people were attracted to miracles, but uh, the people who really get it are people who meditated on and thought about Jesus's words. And they say, uh, we don't need her testimony anymore because we know he is, and a new title gets thrown on the table, the savior of the world. Um, so a pretty exalted title. Um, but do they not need her? Is this yet perhaps another case of dramatic irony um, where they did need her? They wouldn't have had contact with Jesus if it hadn't been for her, and yet they dismiss her. Um, and is this a challenge to the readers? Are you dismissing her too or dismissing anyone who brings the word to you in ways that they might not fully understand? So and there is, as usual, a complex uh, play going on here of um, um, dramatic irony and secondary irony um, that forces readers, I think, to think a little bit about their relationship to who brings them uh, the word of God.